Okay. Uh, okay, so welcome everyone to our info session on the updates to the professional standards for teachers and the candidate assessment of performance. This session is specifically aimed towards sponsoring organization personnel who are working to incorporate these changes on an institutional level. The objective of this session is to learn about the updates to the professional standards for teachers and candidate assessment of performance in order to support implementation during the 25-26 academic year. Um, the topics that we're going to cover today are what are the PSTs and CAP, an overview of the PSTs and the essential elements, um, the an overview of the updated CAP process, data submission for updated CAP in school year 25, um, which is this year, overview of, of the plan for the implementa implementation supports um, for this year, and um, we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. And like always, we'll try to gather questions um, during the presentation and afterward during the Q&A session and answer as many as we can, but anything that we can't get to, we will put in a Q&A doc that we'll send out afterward. Okay, so as always, we want to start today's session with our team's beliefs about educator preparation and the students across Massachusetts. Um, you'll see that we've added a couple of lines here to acknowledge the importance of collaboration um, with families and communities um, and our collaboration with each other to continually improve our education systems. So we believe all students can thrive. We believe all students deserve access to effective educators. We believe through strong preparation, all educators can be effective on day one. We believe edu all educators must support each and every student in their care. We believe students are best supported when families, communities, and educators work together. We believe DESE, sponsoring organizations, and PK-12 schools and districts will need to take action to disrupt inequities. And we believe DESE, sponsoring organizations, and PK-12 schools and districts will need to partner to build an education system that leads, lives up to these beliefs. Um, these beliefs have informed all the revisions that we'll be updating you on today. Um, and now I am going to hand it off to Lindsay. Thanks, Kenzie. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is good to know that you are or hope that you are in front of us in this webinar setting. Um, and again, like Kenzie said, uh, let, give us any feedback on whether this works well given the recording policy or, or not. Um, but today's presentation is going to start with a basic overview um, of PSTs and CAP, and then we'll go into the changes that have been made to the PSTs and CAP in the updated guidelines. There are some new folks in our community, who some of whom are here today, um, and so we do want to just start with those basics of what are the PSTs and CAP um, to make sure everybody is on the same page. So the um, professional standards for teachers and the candidate assessment of performance fit into our overall um, DESE educational vision and the standards of effective practice for teaching in this case, and we also have standards of effective practice um, for administrative leaders. And so it, the PSTs and CAP are really meant to start candidates off with a through line of um, skills that they will continue to build throughout their careers as educators um, and provide that level setting of expectations so that we hope candidates in um, your programs then go into schools and districts who are speaking the same language and have similar expectations for them. So because we want to center that alignment, um, we began work on updating the standards of effective practice about four years ago now. Um, we, during that time, got input from educators, students, family members, district leaders, unions, and advisory groups um, to inform the changes to the language of the elements and to the structure of the model educator evaluation rubric. Um, and we did that because uh, we wanted to be sure that those standards were reflecting equity, evidence-based practices, including anti-racist and culturally and linguistically sustaining practices throughout. 
Um, after the standards of effective practice and the model educator evaluation rubrics were updated as they were being piloted last year, um, we then needed to do the updates to the PSTs, which mirror the elements from the standards of effective practice for teaching, um, and in turn, updates to CAP and to the essential elements to be sure that our expectations in prep both aligned back to those in um, the schools and districts where your completers will ultimately work. And again, that they're really centering evidence-based culture and linguistically sustaining practices. Um, we also got a lot of feedback last year and the year before as we had the program approval guidelines out for public comment and then ultimately being released, um, asking us to do this sooner rather than later and wanting to make sure that those pedagogical skills that we are holding candidates accountable to know and be able to demonstrate are really reflective of our broader vision um, as DESI and as the ed prep team. And we had also gotten feedback um, after using CAP for several years on ways that we could continue to improve that process. So there are two sets of expectations in what Massachusetts believes makes an effective teacher. And those are the content knowledge and the pedagogical skills. Content knowledge for teacher licensure is established through the subject matter knowledge guidelines and assessed throughout um, coursework before um, you ultimately endorse candidates once they're demonstrating fluency. The pedagogical skill expectations are established through the professional standards for teachers or the PSTs. Um, and assessed at different levels throughout coursework and in the candidate assessment of performance to ensure that all of our completers are ready for their licensure role. The Massachusetts Candidate Assessment of Performance, or CAP, is designed to provide a mechanism for candidates to receive high quality feedback from their supervising practitioner and, su and program supervisor that will improve their practice. Um, it is also designed so that by the end of CAP, the supervising practitioner and program supervisor are able to assess the overall readiness of teacher candidates. Um, the structure of CAP also creates an intentional bridge from preparation to practice um, because it mirrors the expectations for pedagogical skills and also is very closely aligned to the educator evaluation cycle for in-service teachers. Um, the candidate assessment of performance is based on a subset of the PSTs called the essential elements. Um, we worked with our PST and CAP working group last year to identify those essential elements from the PSTs, um, and they were selected because they are necessary to be effective on day one for all students, particularly for those students from groups and communities that have been systemically marginalized, that they're feasible for candidates to demonstrate giving, given the varying placement contexts, and that they're able to serve as an umbrella for additional skills outlined in other elements, especially in cases where other elements are prerequisite skills to be able to demonstrate those essential elements. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, I am now going to launch into the updates that were made into uh, made in the PSTs and CAP. Um, the PST document is pretty extensive, so I won't go into the specifics of all the changes that were made to the PSTs, um, but I will go over some of the change the themes of the changes that were made. So the goals of the PST and CAP updates were to align the PSTs and CAP with the standards of effective practice, to identify differentiated levels of practice that identify that aligned with input from the field, research on, uh, and research on um, the development of culturally and linguistically sustaining practice in novice educators, to ensure that CAP is meaningful across settings, um, balance CAP requirements against flexibilities to allow for more meaningful implementation and to support sponsoring organizations to prepare candidates to be ready to well serve all students, especially those from marginally, systemically marginalized groups and communities as novice educators. 
Um, so the PSTs were updated along a few themes. Um, they So they're updated so that evidence-based culturally and linguistically sustaining practices, um, supporting deeper learning for all students are integrated throughout. Practice levels are differentiated by element and not by indicator. And uh, there are updated definitions for introduce practice and demonstrate to better clarify both the connections across the levels of practice and the distinct expectations for elements at each level. Um, and just as an FYI, um, during the info session that's aimed more toward ed prep faculty, uh, that's later in the month, we're gonna spend a little bit more time going into the PSTs um, because they'll be more relevant for coursework. Uh, but for the sake of time during this section, we're going to, uh, this session, we're going to focus more on the essential elements and the structural changes to CAP. Okay, so for the next few slides, I'm going to talk about um, the updates to the essential elements in a little bit, little bit more detail. Um, so the, there are seven essential elements. The first one is subject matter knowledge, um, and you can skim the old essential element there. The new essential element reads um, that the candidate demonstrates sound knowledge of the subject matter by using evidence-based pedagogical, pedagogical practices that enable all students to develop and apply grade level knowledge and skills in relevant and real world contexts, supporting students to make connections between the subject matter and real, real world issues with impact on their communities and their world, and understanding the difference between social and academic language and the importance of this difference in planning and differentiating and delivering effective instruction for English learners at various levels of English language proficiency and literacy. Um, and then obviously in these slides, we've highlighted some of the uh, more salient differences. The next essential element is adjustments to practice. The new essential element reads, uses analysis and conclusions from a wide range of assessment data and feedback from colleagues, students, and families to adjust practice and implement differentiated and scaffolded supports for improved and more equitable student learning outcomes. The next essential element is high expectations and support. And the new essential element reads, supports all students to meet or exceed high expectations for grade appropriate standards aligned learning produce high quality work and develop self-awareness and skills for independent learning by using evidence-based culture, culturally and linguistically sustaining instructional practices to provide equitable opportunities for grade level learning, providing flexible and responsive supports, scaffolds and tools to meet students' needs, communicating clear criteria for success, for example, models, rubrics and exemplars, and reinforcing perseverance and effort with challenging content and tasks. Um, this essential element um, had a change in what the actual essential element was. So the, the old essential element was meeting diverse needs, which is now being replaced by inclusive instruction. Um, so inclusive instruction reads, accommodates and supports individual differences in all students' learning needs, abilities, interests, and levels of readiness, including those of students with disabilities in accordance with relevant IEPs or 504 plans, English learners and former English learners, academically advanced students and students who have been historically marginalized by using appropriate inclusive practices such as tiered supports, educational and assistive technologies, scaffolded instruction, and leveraging students' native language and linguistic resources to make grade level content accessible and affirming for all students, and providing students with multiple ways to learn content and demonstrate understanding. Um, the next one is safe learning environment. And the new essential element reads, creates and maintains a safe, supportive, and inclusive environment by establishing with student input, classroom routines and systems to support student learning, modeling and reinforcing respect for and affirmation of differences related to background, identity, language, strengths, and challenges, supporting student accountability for the impact of their actions, enabling students to take academic risks and share ideas freely, and seeking free feedback from students on their experience of the classroom learning environment and making aligned adjustments to practice. Um, I'm gonna pause on this next one um, for a moment because it's the story behind it is slightly different. Um, so over the course of the pa past eight or so years um, of CAPS original implementation, we had a lot of voices um, from both the prep field and the PK-12 field 
uh, that standard three, which is family and community engagement, absolutely needed to be included in the essential elements. Um, we heard this from teachers who felt that they needed to have acquired these skills in their prep program. We heard from administrators um, who felt that incoming teachers should have stronger skills in this area. Um, and we also heard it from prep programs who wanted to sort of like have the leverage um, to insist that candidates acquire these skills um, and have opportunities to practice them in their practicum. So after a lot of deliberation with the PST and CAP working group and um, hearing input during our stakeholder engagement period, um, collaboration on student learning and well-being rose to the top as the element that would be the most impactful to raise as an essential element. Um, and you, you can read more about sort of the rationale for that decision and the memo that was released with the guidelines as well. Um, so this element reads, partners with families to support students' learning and well-being by leveraging families' cultural and linguistic knowledge and expertise as assets, engaging with families about what students are learning in the classroom and expectations for student success, and collaboratively identifying and seeking family input on strategies and resources for supporting student learning and growth in and out of school. Um, so we are really excited about this being an essential element, and we are actually going to be co-hosting a drop-in session with the National Association for Family, School, and Community Engagement on what it might look like to meet this expectation. Um, that is going to be on December 5th from 10 to 11 a.m., um, and I thought that I would be able to drop a link into the chat, but I'm not sure that I'm going to. Hold on. Let me, let me try and figure it out. I think I can. It is not wanting to paste for me. So I will drop it in the chat um, as soon as I can once I figure out the technical issue with Zoom here. Um, but we will send out that um, meeting invitation registration after this um, meeting as well. Um, okay, and then this is the last one, reflective practice. The new essential element reads, reflects on the effectiveness of instruction and how one's identities, biases, and practices impact learning, student learning, sorry, impact student learning and well-being and works to improve practice and eliminate learning inequities across race, gender, ethnicity, language, disability and ability, and other aspects of student identities such that all students can meet or exceed grade level expectations. Uh, grade level standards, sorry. Okay, so those were the updates to um, the essential elements. I know that you all had them in your guidelines already, but I just wanted to be very clear. Um, And now we're gonna talk about the updates to the CAP process. Um, so there were a few significant changes to the CAP process, which include um, evidence collection, virtual observations, and updates to the CAP form, and updates to the CAP observation form. So we'll go through them one by one. So one of the more significant updates to the CAP process is that evidence collection is now more flexible. Um, so as you know, there are five categories of evidence in CAP and seven essential elements. Um, in the updated guidelines, three of the essential elements, which are subject matter knowledge, high expectations and support, and safe learning environment, um, have to be observed at each observation. Other than that, the only requirements for evidence collection are that each essential element is demonstrated by at least one sorry, is demonstrated by at least two categories of evidence and that it, each type of evidence is used at least once to demonstrate an essential element. So just looking at this table, um, subject matter knowledge is gonna need to be demonstrated by two different types of evidence and each type of evidence, so example, for example, candidate artifacts will need to be used at least once for one of the essential elements. Um, you can do them more, that is totally fine, but those are the required, um, the requirements. Another update is um, the allowance for virtual observations under certain conditions. 
Um, we are going to use the first three years of allowing for these virtual observations to see what kind of data comes out of it and adjust the policy as needed. Um, I'll just read what it says in the guidelines here um, to sort of be very clear about what the expectations are. Um, so programs that intend to conduct any announced observations virtually must submit a statement of assurance to DESE that includes one, a sample recording of a typical virtual observation, and two, a description of how virtual observations will meet the following parameters. So there's the recording, that's a sample, and then a description. Um, so the parameters are that the teacher candidate is, is audible as appropriate and visible throughout the observation. Students are audible as appropriate and visible when participating in full class activities. Students working independently or in groups are visible during relevant portions of the observation. Student work from individual or group activities is visible during relevant portions of the observation. And the recording reflects the, the full observation. No components of instruction are cut or edited except as necessary to remove students without permission to be recorded. Um, those as appropriate, we added um, mostly with consideration to deaf and hard of hearing programs. Um, however, if you feel like you are in a position to be meeting all of these parameters and for some reason that as appropriate is also relevant to the program or the um, virtual observations that you are doing, um, you can interpret that and just give us an explanation. Um, neither of those uh, Neither of the two required unannounced observations may be conducted virtually. If at any time during the practicum, a member of the triad, which is a supervising practitioner, program supervisor, or candidate requests an in-person observation to better support the candidate, that request must be accommodated. Um, we know that it's very important for some programs to be able to run vir uh, observations virtually. Um, so please do submit these materials if you feel that it is necessary for your problem program to meet these virtual observations, to do these virtual observations and that you are able to meet the parameters. Um, and again, we will use the first three years as a data collection period and we'll analyze to ensure that um, standards are still being met uh, despite the virtual nature of the observations. Okay, so here there are a few updates to the CAP form that I also want to go over. Um, so the first section, the first one that you'll see here is that there is a section that rep a representative of the sponsoring organization needs to complete. This is not necessarily the program supervisor, though it could be, um, but it could be any representative of the sponsoring organization. Uh, it is a checklist that verifies that the sponsoring organization is aware of the qualifications of the supervising practitioner which is in alignment with the 2023 program approval guidelines. Um, if the sponsoring organization can't find a supervising practitioner that meets the qualifications, as we outlined in the program approval guidelines, it's the sponsoring organization's responsibility to directly support the candidate with additional resources or guidance to address the gaps. Um, so we just ask that you on this form assess, attest that you understand that responsibility. Um, okay, now I will talk about changes to the observation form, and I'm actually going to stop sharing so that I can share the actual form. Okay, so here's the CAP observation form. You can find this on our website. Um, there are a few changes that I want to talk about here. So the first one is required elements versus optional elements. Um, so as we talked about, these three elements, subject matter knowledge, high expectations and support, and safe learning environment, are required focus elements for observation. So your answer on these three boxes should be yes, because you're required to observe each of those in all of the observations. The optional elements are if you have an opportunity to observe um, evidence related to these elements, that's great. Um, and you can just write yes in one of these boxes. If you do not have an opportunity to observe 
those essential elements during an observation period, that's also totally fine and you can write down. Um, the next difference with this form is the modality of the observation. So um, in the vast majority of cases, the answer to this is gonna be in person. If you are one of those organizations that chooses to submit um, a statement of assurance and um, a sample of a video recording, and that we say that that's great and fine, you can move forward with it, um, then you might select one of these two, which are virtual synchronous and virtual asynchronous. Um, the next change in this form is the active evidence collection box. Um, so. Previously on this form, there was just a little bar that said active evidence collection should be done in a separate form or something like that. Um, so we provided the box here, just so you have it here. We don't intend to use your notes for anything. Um, this is just for your convenience and it can be in any format you want. You can timestamp it, you can bullet it, whatever makes the most sense for you to have your active evidence collection there. Um, this was feedback from that we received from the PST CAP working group that they were like, why are you asking us to pull up two different documents um, if we could just do it on one? So that's why that box is there. And then the last change that was made on this form was actionable feedback and specific strategies for recommendation. Oh, sorry, uh, specific strategies or recommendations. Um, so those are down here. Um, I think on the previous form, it just had areas of strength and areas for growth. So this just goes one step further and asks you to um, be specific about what it is that the candidate could do um, to improve their instruction. We also changed it from areas of refinement and reinforcing and areas of reinforcement to strengths and growth based on feedback that the, the two that are. <laughs> One of those very clear pieces of feedback that was very easy to change. So we were grateful for that feedback. Okay, so those were the changes to the form. Let me go back to the slide deck. Okay. Um, there are also going to be changes in the way that CAP data is going to be submitted. If you have candidates that you're piloting the updated CAP with in the 24-25 school year. Um, so again, you may be in a situation where you're getting ready for 25-26 implementation in a way that does not require you to be doing this with candidates. However, if you are choosing to do use the updated cap with candidates, um, you do have to submit their data. And data submission for those candidates is gonna require a little bit of flexibility this year. Um, so if you are using the CAP online platform, um, you'll enter, you'll modify your submission by entering the information for the new essential element, inclusive, which is inclusive instruction into the um, box for well-structured units and lessons, which is the old essential element. And you'll enter collaboration on the information for collaboration on student learning and well-being, which is a new essential element into meeting diverse needs, which is no longer an essential element. Um, in the CAP online platform, there are some boxes with bolded text and you can't move beyond those pages unless you enter something in those boxes. So you can just feel free to enter like NA in those boxes so that you can move on. Um, the same modification around using those, the information for the new essential elements into the space for the old essential elements is also going to be used if you do not use the CAP online platform and instead use the data submission spreadsheets. So you'll enter the information for inclusive instruction into the column for well-structured units and lessons and um, the information for collaboration on student learning and well-being into the column for meeting diverse needs. Um, this is new information. We thought that maybe we would be able to do an updated spreadsheet um, that would feed into our old system, but it was, too much 
for IT to handle. So we could not do that. So instead, we're just making the same exact modification for CAP Online for the spreadsheets as we're making for CAP Online Platform. Um, if you need more information about this, the this update about the spreadsheets is not on there, but uh, we can update it. The the, all the other information is available on the CAP data submission quick reference guide, and we can drop that link into the chat um, once I figure out what my um, PowerPoint is doing. Um, okay, so this is, we're getting to the end. Um, the implementation support for this year is laid out on this slide. Um, so we are doing, right now we are in the very first info session. Um, there will be three more info sessions, which are um, for different audiences. There's one on October 7th for program supervisors, one on October 17th for supervising practitioners and PK-12 partners, and one on October 5th for ed prep faculty. Um, and again, that one will, will focus more on the PST updates that they can incorporate into their coursework. Um, and then we are also expecting to release the uh, quick reference guides and the updated handbook this month. Um, we have the family and community engagement drop-in session on December 5th. Um, we will be releasing the CAP and PST intro videos um, in November. Um, those will be able to be um, shown directly to uh, candidates and supervising practitioners. We'll be holding a mini community of practice that will be specifically for organizations that indicated on their statement of, on their implementation plan. Um, that they would be doing a large scale implementation. So that will be a, um, a community that will sort of support each other in that implementation. We'll be doing communities of practice specifically around the essential elements and evidence um, in January, uh, January through April of 2025. Um, we will be doing drop-in sessions on uh, more specific topics sort of similar to um, the family and community engagement one um, in March and April of next year. Um, the communities of practice um, will create a library of examples um, that will be uh, uploaded to our website um, and that will be in June 2025. And then supervising practitioner training, we know that it has been requested a lot and we know that it is um, it's been a, an ask from the field for a long time. So we are working on that, what that could look like, um, but most likely it will be in collaboration with um, the work that we've been doing for the registered teacher apprenticeship. So you can um, keep listening for what that might look like. And then just to revisit our expectations, um, we are asking that you submit an implementation plan and a statement of assurance by October 18th, 2024. I know that the document itself says October 31st. Um, that was a typo. I apologize. It has caused more confusion than it was worth. Um, it We are asking that it is submitted by October 18th. And the reason for that is that we just want to be able to get that mini community of practice going as soon as possible. So the sooner we know who's doing that large scale implementation, the better. Um, and then we are asking for full implementation by the 25-26 school year. And then this year, again, is going to be used to prepare for full implementation um, for the 25-26 school year. Okay, we are gonna jump into questions. Um, if you are joining us asynchronously, thank you. We're gonna end the recording here.